moderating today's webinar. Uh, so just to start, we'll go through a few housekeeping items. Um, the expert angle team will be moderating the questions, and questions will be answered during the question and answer period towards the end of the webinar. Only participants with access to a computer during the webinar will be able to ask the questions by typing them into the text box in their, their control panel. And all attendees are automatically placed on mute to allow for the best quality of audio. Um, so I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jennifer Jones. She is the Director of Research for the Cancer Survivorship Program and an Associate Director of the Center for Health, Wellness, and Cancer Survivorship, uh, also known as Elixir at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. In addition, she's an Associate Professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Dalla School of Public Health at University of Toronto. And Dr. Jones's research program has focused primarily on the quality of life and psychosocial issues of individuals and their families facing cancer. Her most recent scholarly and professional activities have clustered around transitional research to inform clinical survivorship care and fostering innovative health professional and continuing education that is designed to transform the patient experience. Uh, so with that said, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Jones. Great. Pat. Thanks, Catherine. That was a nice, a nice introduction. And I'm really pleased to be able to do this today. Um, this is work that I've been involved in over the past several years with uh, one of my colleagues, Shabir Alibi. And so it's been nice putting this presentation together to sort of um, summarize all the things that we've learned over the past few years and to be able to share it with you today. So I'll just go to my first slide. All right. I guess you go over. You've gone over this already. Um, so basically, I'm sure everybody online is familiar with prostate cancer. That this is one of the most commonly diagnosed malignancies in Canadian men. Um, what we know over the past number of decades, as with other disease um, uh, cancer cancer sites like breast cancer, is that the mortality rates for prostate cancer have significantly decreased over the past two decades. And so for people with early stage disease, the overall five-year survival now is greater than 95%. So this is really, I think, a wonderful success story. And I think as a result of this, um, there's been a movement to sort of start shifting some of our thinking to uh, a more wellness-centered approach, um, thinking about cancer survivorship and the treatments that we've given to people and how we need to um, uh, include an approach that uh, it doesn't just monitor sur uh, surveillance, um, doesn't just include surveillance for um, recurrence and um, for secondary cancers, but also is an approach that includes health promotion um, and focuses on the maximizing of quality of life and um, our ability to minimize dysfunction and disability so that we can uh, uh, provide um, support, support for people to have a good overall well-being. So antigen deprivation therapy, or ADT, is a very common uh, treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, the statistics really right now show that about uh, every um, one in two men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer at some point will receive ADT, so that's 50% of men. And uh, it tr in the past, ADT was really used for more um, advanced disease, but we, what we're seeing now um, is the trend towards using this um, in, at earlier stages of disease and for people being on ADT for much longer periods of time than they used to. We know that ADT is very effective at reducing tumor growth um, as a symptom management approach, and it can extend survival and improve quality of life for people. Um, but we also know that um, ADT uh, it can also have, um, uh, is, is associated with a number of side effects. Um, and there's a lot more attention now, I think, that's being paid to uh, these side effects and how we can help people to manage some of these. So some of the long-term side effects that are associated with um, uh, long-term ADT use is a loss of libido, vasomotor motor flushing, um, muscle and lean body mass, which is replaced, so loss of, sorry, muscle and lean body mass, which is replaced with fat tissue. And probably one of the most um, well-documented side effects is um, bone loss or osteopenia or osteoporosis, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. 
So osteoporosis is a bone disease that's characterized by low, low bone, bone mass, and it uh, results in bone fragility, so weak bones, basically, and this can result in um, fractures for people. <clears throat> in the general population, um, the consequences of osteoporosis are fairly significant. Um, it's related to very high rates of mortality, so this is typically as a result of fractures that people may have. It can have an impact on quality of life, functional impairment, longer hospital stays when there is a fracture, pain, sleep disturbances, fatigue, and depression. In the general population, just um, not with people who are on ADT, we know that about 45% of men who are older than 65 years of age will have osteoporosis or low, low bone mineral density. And the lifetime risk for fracture for men over the age of 50 is about 13%. And I think sometimes people are a little bit surprised by these numbers because we often think of osteoporosis as a disease that affects women. And for a lot of men, osteoporosis is not really always on their radar. And they don't realize that they are also at risk for osteoporosis, just men in the general population as well. So when we think about osteoporosis and fractures, there are typically some um, common sites where people would fracture if they do have a fracture or a fall. Um, wrist fractures are common, fractures along the vertebrae, so that's on your back, or hip fractures. And again, all of these are associated with very significant impairments in quality of life, very long hospital stays, um, very expensive. Um, obviously, these are very painful, so they have significant um, impact on people's lives. So um, just to give you a little bit of background on how osteoporosis usually is diagnosed or how we usually uh, monitor people's bone health, um, typically this is done by doing a bone mineral density test. And sometimes you may call, hear this as a DEXA test or a dual energy x-ray absorbentometry uh, scan, which is um, really basically just measures the density of your bones. And it's a very quick uh, test. It takes 15 minutes. It's painless, it's just a scan. And um, based on the results of that, and they, they take your height and your age and all of that, you get a T-score. Um, and then this is compared with the bone density of an average uh, um, uh, adult with the same gender and ethnicity as yourself. And then based on the T-score that a person will get, um, they would be categorized as either, either having um, no, normal bone density low bone density or osteopenia, or osteoporosis. We know um, from literature just in the general population that without bone mineral density testing, 80% of patients who have had fractures uh, were not uh, treated properly for osteoporosis. So people come in with fractures who have never had a bone mineral density test and were never treated properly for osteoporosis. So these are uh, I think the general thought is that a lot of these fractures and these things can be prevented, general screening. So this is just a picture for you to give you a, um, a visualization of what osteoporosis kind of looks like when we look at bone. So if you look at just normal bone, um, you can see when you look at the osteoporosis, there's sort of a thinning of the bone. And that's what they're going to look like, look at. These are what the things that they would look at in the scan. So just going back to ADT now, because I've been just talking about osteoporosis in general, we know that um, oste testosterone is, a, um, imp is important for the normal health of a range of different body functions. And this includes the maintenance of bone mass. And that when somebody has low or no testosterone levels, it may cause bone thinning, um, a decrease in muscle mass, and an increase in the rate of bone turnover so that the bones become less solid, which is the picture I showed you before. And when people lose bone mass, there's less pull on the bones, which means that the bones um, don't have, um, have this bone thinning as well. So the bone, the decrease of muscle mass is really important as well. We also know that um, prostate cancer occurs at a time when just in naturally testosterone levels are already just decreasing in men because of age. But then when we initiate ADT with patients, this can result in very significant um, and very rapid uh, bone and muscle loss 
Um, so we see quite a rapid bone loss and muscle loss in that first year of ADT. And this really um, uh, accentuates the risk or um, uh, multiplies one's risk for osteoporosis and fractures because of this. So what we see actually is a, a five to tenfold increase in loss of bone mineral density at when you look at different skeletal uh, sites, looking at hip, spine, and upper limb. And this is in the first year of having of being on ADT. So there's a, a massive loss, um, very rapid loss. And um, the risk of fracture in men who are on ADT is two times higher than that of men who don't have prostate cancer and aren't on ADT or compared to men who have prostate cancer but are not receiving ADT, so a much higher rate of uh, fracture. There was a recent very large study that came out of the States last year that showed that 58% of men who were high risk of a fracture when they started their ADT and 38% of men who are low risk for fracture develop at least one fracture after ADT. And this was associated with um, a high, higher overall mortality, so death rate. So that's, those are very high rates. So people who are already at risk for osteoporosis and, and fracture, um, uh, have almost 60% of them will end up fracturing after being on ADT. So this is, this is a, a graph that I just wanted to include just to show you um, the, the trend of how um, bone mineral density sort of decreases if you look over time. So if you're looking at the bottom here, this is when you start ADT. Hopefully you can see my pointer as I move it. Um, and then over time up till 10 years. This line here with the squares is normal bone mineral density. And it shows how it decreases. And then the, the line with these diamonds um, shows the rate of um, osteoporosis over time. So some people come in um, before they even have their ADT and they already have low bone mineral density or osteoporosis. Um, but you see over time um, it goes up to very high rates. So as a result of all this, um, and there's been lots that we've learned about osteoporosis just in the general population. Um, several, uh, about five years, uh, per, it's been longer than that, about uh, seven years ago, the um, genital urinary radiation oncologist of Canada developed um, a healthy bone consensus guideline to help um, to guide um, urologists and uh, radiation oncologists who are treating men with uh, prostate cancer and who are on ADT about specifically about bone health. And this is, really came about because there was consensus that um, this is obviously an issue for men who are on ADT. There's this rapid bone loss with ra high risk of fracture. Um, but we also know that osteoporosis is a preventable, preventable, preventable disease, sorry, and um, that there are things that we can do to prevent this from happening. So the guideline statement um, that came out from GUROC um, really just suggests, and this is based on um, statements and guidelines from the general population as well, is that when uh, a man is initiated on ADT, he should get a baseline DEXA or bone mineral density test. And this should be re repeated. Um, at that time, a 10-year fracture risk estimation should be done using a tool. So I'll go through each of these in detail in the next slides coming up. Um, <clears throat> that the men should be counseled around initiating and maintaining healthy bone behaviors. And for people who are at high risk of fracture at the initiation of ADT, that um, pharmacologic therapy should be initiated or considered. So I'll go through each of these recommendations. The first one is the baseline routine bone mineral density test and risk assessment. And this should be done um, at the time that you initiate ADT. So um, while on ADT, a bone mineral density test should be done at baseline. So this is at the start. So this gives the um, uh, clinician a sense of where you're at and if you're at high risk. And then every one to two years, it should be repeated so that they can be monitoring your bone health to see if there are any changes. Also, um, they can use a tool that has been developed by the WHO called the FRAX, or in Canada we have a tool called the PAROC, 
and this helps them. They just plug in the results from your bone mineral density test, as well as your age and a few clinical features, and it gives them an estimation of what, how, um, what your risk level is for having a fracture. And based on that, they can decide whether they need to do um, pharmacologic uh, therapy to prevent bone, bone uh, any fractures. So this is just a slide showing what the fracture assessment, uh, risk assessment tool from the World Health Organization looks like. Um, so you, you could even go in and try this out yourself if you wanted. Um, so if you don't have a bone mineral density test, a recent one, it can still do it without it. But um, if you do have a bone mineral density test, you can put in the results. And your clinicians, when you uh, go for your bone mineral density test, often the clinics will do this and then send this along to your clinician. So that's the first thing, and that's what should be getting, that should be um, something that your healthcare providers should be doing. They should be ordering this bone mineral density test, they should be doing the fracture risk assessment and monitoring your bone health uh, while you're on ADT. And then there are things that you could be doing as um, a person on ADT, um, and these are all things that have been shown in the literature to be um, ways to help prevent bone loss. So some of the first things that we, we would counsel people on would be to start with healthy bone behaviors. So quitting smoking, um, there's lots of reasons to quit smoking, but smoking also blocks your body from being able to use calcium, and calcium is important for um, your bone health. So it's important if you're a smoker to try to quit smoking. Um, limit or avoid, avoid alcohol. So again, alcohol and caffeine can also help you, can also affect your bones through loss of calcium. So Try to limit your alcohol, the alcohol you drink, to two servings per day, and limit your caffeine. So try to limit it to no more than three cups of coffee or tea in a day. Um, probably the most important thing that you can do is to get calcium and vitamin D every day. So um, based on the, your age, there are different uh, recommendations for how much vitamin D or calcium you should be getting. So men aged 50 to 69 need a total of 1,000 milligrams of calcium and 800 to 1,000 IUs of vitamin D. And if you're age 70 or older, the calcium goes up to 1,200 milligrams with, um, again, the same amount of vitamin D. So the general recommendation is at least 1,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, it's important when you think about calcium, though, that you only stop supplement, so take a calcium pill if you're not getting enough um, calcium from your diet. So you can, if you're getting lots of calcium from your diet, eating lots of calcium-rich foods like almonds, um, calcium-fortified orange juices, milk and dairy, um, things like salmon, different beans, and lentils, they can provide lots of calcium for you. And so, um, you can meet with a dietitian and figure out how much calcium you're getting through your diet alone. And if you're not getting enough, you can, you can supplement to bring yourself up to the um, 1,200 milligrams of calcium. But it's important that you don't get too much calcium in your diet because there are some studies that are coming out now that showing that calcium um, may actually be harm too much calcium may actually be harmful. Okay, and then the next thing, which I know is a struggle for all of us, is trying to get um, into the habit of doing regular weight-bearing and muscle-strengthening exercises, so going out, getting some exercise in every week. So weight-bearing exercises are activities where your legs and your feet support the weight of your body, and this will help um, to uh, help you with um, gaining muscle, as well as muscle-strengthening exercises, and working on your bones. So examples of weight-bearing exercises would be just taking a walk, jogging or hiking, um, if you go to play golf, or walking the course. Um, and the goal is to try to do um, up to 150 minutes per week or 20 to 25 minutes per day. And in addition, it's recommended that you try to do some muscle, muscle strengthening exercises, especially since we know that ADT re um, results in a loss of bone mass or muscle mass, so you want to try to keep your muscles up. So uh, those can be going to the gym and using some of the weight machines. You can use free weights or dumbbells at home, or even using bands can help. And you want to try to aim to do these two to three times per week. So um, 
those are the recommend so I'll just go back. Those are the recommendations right now. Those are the guidelines that are in place for people who are on ADT. Um, and over the past few years, there have been a number of studies that have started to emerge looking at how well are we doing in terms of actually managing bone health from the perspective of both the healthcare providers and the, the men who are on ADT themselves. What kind of behaviors are they engaging in? So I'm going to review a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing asking some of these questions. So what we know is that preliminary results that are out there suggest that most men do not receive adequate education or bone health management and often aren't even told that bone loss is a side effect or a risk fact that you're at risk when you're on ADT of bone loss. We also know that routine screening and evaluation of bone loss through um, bone mineral density testing in men receiving AD is very, ADT is very low, and I'll, and I'll show you some stats on that in a minute. Few radiation oncologists and urologists are prescribing bisphosphonates, or the, which are the medications um, that are given to people who are at high risk for fracture when they um, uh, uh, go on ADT. So it's a, it's a medication that's given to people um, prophylactically, so um, just to prevent those fractures. And um, variable, we also see that there's lots of variability in the practice patterns and um, the healthcare providers that are treating men on ADT aren't necessarily clear on what the risk is or you know, what they should be doing. We also know in terms of men on ADT that they're often unaware that osteoporosis is a side effect of their medication. So I'll go into now, the next slide is um, looking at um, screening for osteoporosis. Um, and so this is actually the behaviors of the healthcare providers that are treating men on ADT. So this was a study that was um, published in um, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2012 by Shabir Alibi, who's um, a colleague of mine here at, at University Health Network. And basically what this graph is showing is um, he did a large study of um, looking at the ordering of bone mineral density tests from 1995 to 2008 in Ontario. And what he found was the use of bone mineral density tests within two years of starting ADT ranged from basically 0.5 per 100 persons years in 1995 up to, which is good, we see an improvement, but basically 18% in 2008. So what he found was in 2008, only 18% of men were actually getting routine bone mineral density tests men who were on ADT. So this is very, very low. And even those ADT users that were at high risk, which is on this graph, um, the people that have the triangle, um, <clears throat> or a prior diagnosis, sorry, of osteoporosis in the square. Um, so even the ordering of bone mineral density tests remained um, low even in that population, so never reaching 50% of the, of the patients. So we did our own study actually recently um, with, a, with a student here that was doing training with us named Katie Byes. And um, what we wanted to do was a survey of Canadian um, urologists and radiation oncologists across Canada um, to get a sense of what their practice, pattern were, practice patterns were and also um, their feelings of confidence, competencies around um, uh, managing bone loss and um, also for us to get a sense of what support they needed to be able to improve the uptake of the guidelines that are in place. So we did a um, survey with, a, and we had 156 um, urologists and radiation oncologists reply to this. Um, the majority of them saw at least six or more new prostate cancer patients per month, month so they're actively seeing prostate cancer patients. So the first slide here, Basically, we asked um, the prostate cancer specialists uh, questions about um, uh, testing their knowledge on um, bone, bone health. So we asked them first how frequently should they be ordering DEXA scans or bone mineral density scans. And most of them were pretty aware. Um, so 76% were correct that they should be done at least every one to two years. They were pretty um, knowledgeable regarding what the vitamin D recommendations were, but less so in terms of calcium. And then there was lots of um, uh, confusion sort of around how much exercise should be, be recommended to patients. So they were unsure uh, about that. And then when we asked them to estimate osteoporosis risk for a 60-year-old just in the general population, only 23% were able to 
uh, correctly identify this. And when we asked about osteoporosis risk after one year of ADT, only 38% were able to correctly identify that risk. Um, we asked them to sort of reflect on their own feelings of competencies around managing bone. And this graph um, shows how they rated their competencies. So um, basically, this, these bars each show whether they felt um, pretty comp competent. So uh, um, what we saw was that um, we had the highest rates of competencies sort of around being able to provide recommendations on um, vitamin D and calcium. So about uh, um, two-thirds were feeling pretty confident about being able to do that. Um, sorry, this slide doesn't look very good here. But, um, and then we saw lower levels in terms of providing recommendations for sort of secondary prevention. So that's counseling patients on the behaviors that they could do, like the exercise and um, limiting alcohol and, ca and calcium, or sorry, and caffeine. So that was at 44%. And we saw quite um, low rates, so the 20 and the 21 percent, in terms of actually being able to identify people at risk using the tools that are available, like that WHO tool that I showed you, um, or being able to actually manage people that have been identified as having osteoporosis. Um, and that's not so surprising because this isn't necessarily uh, has not necessarily been in their scope of practice since they're urologists and radiation oncologists, and bone hasn't been something that they focused on really in their training. Um, we also asked how confident they felt about providing self-management education, so really counseling people to uptake behaviors around managing their these side effects. And um, we saw very low sort of feelings of competency around that, and also um, very low feelings of competency around being able to provide education at an appropriate reading or language level for patients. We also asked them how often they were ordering, uh, routinely ordering DEXA scans for their, um, so bone mineral density scans for their patients. So we saw that only um, about a third were um, routinely ordering, um, and this is at their own admission, so this, this is um, maybe even lower because uh, these were people who applied to a survey, so may, maybe the other people who didn't reply to this survey were people who wouldn't be as um, oriented to this. But we saw about a third said that they um, routinely ordered baseline DEXA scans, or bone mineral density scans, and a bit higher, around 37% were doing this um, uh, every one to two years for um, patients who are on ADT. Um, so the next group uh, work that we did was with a, uh, another a medical student that came through our center here, Michelle Nadler. And she did um, some really interesting work looking at um, the actual patients and their experience and knowledge and um, behaviors around bone health. And this was a paper that was published uh, um, this year in um, the British Journal of Urology. So basically, she just wanted to describe um, doing a survey again with um, patients with prostate cancer receiving ADT, uh, um, describe their knowledge, um, self-efficacy, so how confident they feel, and their health beliefs around osteoporosis and their current engagement in healthy bone behavior. So this study included 175 patients who were receiving ADT, and they, uh, as I said, just completed um, some questionnaires. So what we found in our population was that 12% uh, um, had had a previous fracture, 10% um, said that they had already been diagnosed with osteoporosis. And then when we did bone mineral density scans um, on these men, most of them hadn't had one, so we ordered them for them. Um, we found that um, uh, 42 had normal bone density, but 46 had low um, bone mineral density, so osteopenia. And an additional 6% um, had, uh, uh, were identified as having osteoporosis. And then we did a fracture risk assessment. So about 23% were at moderate to high risk of having a fracture. Um, and when we asked the men how many of them had had a bone mineral density test in the past two years, about, um, you know, uh, just over one-third said that they had. So this correlates pretty well with our survey of um, the healthcare professional. Um, we asked them about, we had them fill out um, validated questionnaires um, testing their knowledge around osteoporosis. So this is the knowledge here, questionnaire. 
And they scored quite low, so on a possible range of 0 to 19, a score of 0 to 19. Um, the score was the average for this, this whole sample was 9.6. Um, so that's quite a low uh, knowledge score. So they, the men were typically just not very knowledgeable at all about osteoporosis, really, um, which, again, isn't something that surprised us, knowing that, um, as I said before, a lot of men don't really think about osteoporosis as a, a disease that would affect them. Self-efficacy is a concept. It basically is measuring somebody's confidence about um, managing something. So we use a self-efficacy scale that asks them about their um, confidence in, in being able to manage bone loss through exercise or through supplementation. And, and generally, the self-efficacy was fairly high. People felt fairly confident that they could, they could do this. We then had a questionnaire on health beliefs, so asking them about their perceptions or um, um, feelings of susceptibility, how serious it is, and how motivated they are to deal with um, osteoporosis. So um, this was on a range of 6 to 30, a possible range of um, scale. And so what we saw was that the men were typically pretty motivated when you look at the health motivation score, but they felt that they um, weren't susceptible. So there was low susceptibility scores, so they felt they weren't susceptible to osteoporosis, despite the fact that they were all on ADT and they didn't really feel it was that serious. And then we asked them about engagement in healthy bone behaviors and what they were actually doing. So we found that in this sample of 175 men, very few of them um, were smoking and most of them weren't heavy drinkers, so that wasn't really an issue, so that was great. Um, there was um, lots of them getting good levels of calcium, either through diet or supplementation but um, fewer were um, getting the appropriate amount of vitamin D, and only 30% were getting the right amount of exercise. So basically all of this research really has highlighted to us that there's a big knowledge to practice um, gap, meaning that we know that, um, the, uh, that ADT can result in bone loss, which can result in fractures, and we know that there's things that we can do to prevent, prevent this. But we also know from this literature that routine screening and evaluation of bone loss in men receiving ADT is generally very low. And um, the majority of men on ADT are unaware that bone loss is a side effect, have low knowledge about osteoporosis, and are not engaging in healthy bone behaviors that they can do to help prevent their bone loss. So just to finish up, I just wanted to highlight a couple things that we're doing to try to address this. Um, so this is, as you can see, sort of a program of research where we were trying to identify where the gaps were in the problems were, and now we're trying to address those in a sort of multifaceted way. So one thing Joel, our medical student, did was to do a very simple um, intervention study with the same men that did that baseline, the 175 men that did that best baseline questionnaire that I just showed you. Um, basically, with those men, oh, I'll just, uh, I forgot about this slide. So just so you know, we, we drew upon the um, literature from osteoporosis in general. And what we found that was that interventions that are very short, um, so they could be short classes or mailed pamphlets or anything like that, in the general population, when we look at osteoporosis, these types of interventions can improve people's knowledge about osteoporosis and their health beliefs around their susceptibility and the seriousness of it. But they're typically just giving somebody a pamphlet doesn't change behavior. So what usually leads to change is in behavior around bone health are more multimodal interventions. So these could be like multiple education sessions or classes, using online education, more um, interactive things, or also the provision of bone mineral density results to people just so that they have an understanding or even undergoing a bone mineral density test so people understand what their risk level is. So what we did in our study was um, uh, we recruited men from the um, GU clinic at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And these were men who were on ADT that spoke English. And um, they couldn't have symptomatic metastatic disease, but they could have metastatic disease as long as they weren't um, symptomatic. And we did this baseline assessment just from the data I showed you before where we asked them about their, no their knowledge of osteoporosis, their feelings of self-efficacy, their health beliefs, and what behaviors they were engaging in. And then after that, men were given, um, most of them had not 
a lot of them had not had um, a bone mineral density scan, so we referred them for this. They had a, the FRAX assessment was done. And at, based on that, they were then mailed a personal re, personalized risk assessment. So it was a letter that explained to them what their risk was, the results of their bone mineral density scan, and it also included an education booklet um, that was very detailed, and it provides lots of tips on ways that you can um, prevent bone loss and take care of your bones. And then three months after this was mailed, we just followed up with the same men and asked them to fill out the same questionnaires again to see if anything had changed. And so what we found was that um, as a result of this really simple intervention of just sending the men their results and giving them some information on what osteoporosis is and what they can do, we saw that their knowledge went up, their, um, their feelings of susceptibility went up, um, health motivation stayed the same, but it was already pretty high. So they felt more susceptible, which is a good thing because they are susceptible and maybe they didn't feel susceptible because they didn't understand that they were at risk. Um, what's interesting, it was, we saw that um, confidence levels actually went down. And that's not um, something unusual. We see this sometimes um, when people aren't necessarily aware of what they have to do, they feel pretty confident. And then when you tell them what they need to do, um, it can make people feel a little less confident, like, oh, gee, I didn't know I had to do all these things. And so they don't feel as confident anymore. And um, in terms of the behaviors, what we saw was, again, the alcohol and smoking were already, they, people weren't um, doing that, so that was good. Um, we saw that calcium um, changed a bit, and I'll show you that in a minute, um, because on this slide it doesn't look like it um, went up all that much, but I'll show you why. We did see a big improvement in vitamin D intake, so more men were taking vitamin D, and we saw a trend towards more um, exercise. So this uh, exercise slide shows how many people were actually getting 150 minutes a week, but there were, um, if we look at just the total number of minutes a week, uh, total number of minutes, um, it went up. So when we look at the calcium intake, um, we divided people by what baseline calcium they were getting, uh, what they were, how much calcium they were getting at baseline. And what we saw was in this group, first um, two bars here, these were the group of men that were getting less than the recommended amount of calcium uh, per day. And uh, you can see a big improvement in those um, from baseline, which is the blue bars, up to um, the follow-up. And then um, we saw that men who were sort of at baseline getting the recommended amounts, they even incre uh, increased their amounts as well. But what's interesting is that there was a group of men that were getting too much calcium. They were having too much through their diet and then also supplementation. And so what we saw was that that went down. And that's actually a good thing. They still went down and they were still in, the, in a good level of calcium that they should be getting, but they weren't getting too much anymore. And finally, um, we were just recently uh, funded through the Canadian Cancer Society Research Institute to do a knowledge translation study, really trying to target within the clinics um, what the healthcare providers can do to help support men. And um, this is an intervention called Bone RX, or Bone, basically a healthy bone prescription, and it targets both the healthcare providers and the patients. And it's really just served as a reminder for to prompt the guidelines. Um, and it's coupled with um, an education uh, booklet, the same one that Michelle used in her study. And basically the innovation is that um, men would receive a healthy bone prescription, which I'll show you a slide of it, what it looks like, um, at the initiation of ADT. And as I said, it just serves as a reminder or prompt for guideline adherent practice um, and targeted education for the patient. So they would get a pre-populated healthy bone prescription, which prompts the prostate cancer specialist to order a bone mineral density test. So it prompts them and reminds them, you've got to order this test, and includes clear guidelines with specific recommendations in terms of how much calcium and vitamin D men should be getting, how much exercise, and um, limiting their caffeine and alcohol. So it's an easy tool for healthcare providers to give to patients. They don't have to remember what the guidelines say. It's already written in the, in the prescription. And then men are also given the patient booklet, the Building Strong Bones, that one, that same booklet that Michelle gave out in her study. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is the bone prescription for op optimal bone health. So it just prompts, it gives um, recommendations, very clear recommendations for men on what they should be doing, how much calcium, vitamin D they should be getting. And it's also paired with this Building Strong Bones um, pamphlet, which is a, a really nice um, 
um, uh, book list that provides lots of um, tips and um, tips on terms of the different ed um, exercises you can be doing, the types of calcium and vitamin D um, supplementation that you can consider. And that's it. So I know I've run way over. I hope um, we have, still have a little bit of time for questions. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, so we do have a few questions that have been coming in, which is great. So we'll start off with um, the first one, which is how much is too much calcium and how can calcium be harmful for your health? Okay. So I think there's a little bit of debate over this um, with the lit recent literature that's come out, um, with some studies showing that um, you know if you go over 2,000 milligrams of um, of calcium that it can actually um, be harmful to your heart. So this is not um, at all an area of expertise that I have, but the recommendations now are that you should try to stay within that guideline of around 1,200 um, milligrams of uh, calcium per day. Great. Uh, the next question is, uh, this person wrote in saying that they've heard of using the estrogen patch instead of shots for ADT. Which has the lower effect on bone loss, and is this a, a viable treatment option? Um, I, I cannot answer that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know what I would recommend? is that, um, and I would recommend to anybody on the call who has ADT that, uh, and if they haven't had discussions with their uh, prostate cancer specialist about their bone, that they, uh, at their next appointment, that they have these types of discussions. Um, we found actually that when we gave out people this, the booklet and their uh, bone mineral density results, that um, a huge number of them went and took those results and had great discussions with their family doctor or with their prostate cancer specialist, um, and they had never had these discussions before. So these are things that you need to consider, because uh, I can't give uh, treatment advice on this seminar, but I think these are things that you need to consider um, discussing with your prostate cancer specialist. Great. Uh, the next question is, do you know what the outcomes are for men who do weight-bearing and muscle strengthening exercises before and after ADT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think the studies are out yet. We know in the general population that um, these kind of things do um, are um, beneficial for your bone health, but they haven't been done specifically in ADT, ADT populations. There is a recent study that just came out this year um, by Shabir Alibi, again, who looked at the effect of vitamin D supplementation, and he found that it did have a significant effect. So, uh, you know, a lot of what we are recommending for men on ADT is uh, drawn from the literature in the general population, but hasn't been specifically done in ADT populations, and that research needs to be done. Great. Uh, the next question is, is there a relationship between osteopenia and prostate cancer spreading to the bone? Mm, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't believe that there is. Again, a question that you, you could have, a, a discussion you could have with your prostate cancer specialist, but uh, I don't believe that that's, that that's Okay. Uh, the next question is, can you comment on food versus supplements for bone health, and is there a difference in the way that nutrients are absorbed, whether you're taking, um, taking them through food or supplements? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, ideally you get your calcium through food, your food, and, um, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to absorb it better. I'm not a dietitian, but you're going to absorb your uh, calcium better when you have it, uh, you know, through Food. And, we, and we actually, when you do a calcium um, calculator, so they have these online where you can put in what you're eating and it can calculate how much calcium you are getting through your diet. Um, you know, people, people get a pretty good amount through their diet, more than, more than they probably think that they're getting. So what the first step is to try to figure out, and also um, Ontario has a, um, which I can send to you after this, uh, Catherine, if you want to put it on your website, but um, there is a, a tool-free number that anybody can call, and you get access to a registered dietitian in Ontario. And other provinces may have this as well. Um, oh, sorry, I know that not everybody on the call is from Ontario. Um, but uh, they can help you to sort of figure out how much you're getting from your diet. And then based on that, if you aren't getting enough, you can then figure out, you can go to the pharmacy, and you can figure out 
what level of calcium that you need to get. So again, it is important to keep in mind though that things like alcohol, um, caffeine, um, and smoking can also, they can all affect how much uh, calcium you absorb, so it's important to limit those. Great. Uh, the next question goes along uh, that in terms of dosages for vitamin D, and is taking 2,500 IUs of vitamin D daily too much? I, I don't think there's any literature yet to suggest that there, there, it is too much. So I think that that's, that's okay. I don't think, uh, I, generally you don't need that much. Um, you know, the recommendations are 1,000. Now some of the recommendations go up to 2,000, but, um, you know, there's not, I, I'm not aware of any studies that show any danger higher than that. Great. Uh, if you halt ADT after one year and restart only after a significant rise in PSA, mm -hmm. will that help in the onset of osteoporosis or will that not have any effect on the general result? Yeah, I mean, I think what we see is that there's a big amount of bone loss in that first year. So if you're on it for a year, you've probably had some um, uh, bone mineral density um, decrease, decreases in your bone mineral density over that year. And then when it's halted, um, you know, if you're able to get that muscle back on your body, so if you've noticed that there have been changes, that you're able to be exercising, getting the muscle back, so it's pulling on the bone and helping the bone to, um, you know, build up again. That's the great thing about bones is that, um, you know, bones bones can strengthen, so, you, you know, you can uh, build them back again. And, that, and that's why this is so important, because these are things that people can actually do to prevent this. So um, just because you're on ADT doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that you will get osteoporosis. Um, if we monitor it, if, if you're at high risk, if we, if we give you, there's pharmaceuticals that we can give to people, um, so this, this phosphonates, um, there are lots of things that you can be doing, all the things that I outlined in this talk to help prevent that bone loss. Uh, great. So we're on the last question, which is calcium supplements may cause gastrointestinal side effects. Should the calcium supplement be consumed in smaller doses across all three meals to reduce gastrointestinal side effects? Um, again, a little bit out of my scope, uh, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. Okay, great. Uh, actually, we just had one last question come in, which is, can you exercise when you are on ADT? Yes, yeah, you should be. You should definitely be exercising when you're at ADT. I know it, there, it, it is important because um, if you do have bone loss, you know, sometimes you're at a bit of a higher risk for, um, and also with muscle loss, a little bit of a higher risk for falls. So you have to be really careful. Um, so going for walks, um, you know, using bands and, and uh, some um, machines are probably safer than the free weights. Um, but yeah, definitely there's recommendations that you should be exercising, you need to be exercising when you're on ADT. Great, thank you. So that uh, comes, draws a claw to our question and answer, or close to our question and answer period. And I'd just like to thank Dr. Jones and all of the registered participants for coming together uh, to discuss ADT and bone health. Uh, just to remind participants that an evaluation will be emailed to you tomorrow. Uh, it's short, so please take a few minutes to run through it as it will help us to improve our Expert Angle webinar series. And our next webinar is on December 3rd at 3 p.m. Our guest speaker will be Colleen Young, and she's the Manager of Social Innovation at Elixir at Prince the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. And Colleen will be discussing how you can use social media safely for your health and well-being. So once again, thank you, Dr. Jones, for your great presentation. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.